war. We're not winning it. If you speak a word of what I'm about to show you, you will be executed for high treason. It's beautiful. It's the greatest encryption device in history, and the Germans use it for all communications. Everyone thinks Enigma is unbreakable. Let me try, and we'll know for sure. Mr. Turing, do you know how many died because of it? I don't. Three, while we've been having this conversation. Gentlemen, meet Mr. Turing. We you to work together, then? I'm afraid these men would only slow me down. Popular at school, were you? We're short on staff. We get more staff, then. You have six minutes to complete the task. Is it even possible? No, it takes me eight. Five minutes and 34 seconds. You said to do it in under six. What is it that we're really doing? We were going to break an unbreakable Nazi code and win the war. Oh. You know, to pull off this irascible genius routine, one actually has to be a genius. I'm designing a machine that will allow us to break every message, every day, instantly. You're going to need all the help you can get, and they are not going to help you if they do not like you. Have you decrypted a single German message? You will never understand the importance of what I am creating here. Our patience has expired. No! If you fire Helen, well, then you'll have to fire me. Me too. And me. You better bloody work. Helen, you do not have to do this alone. What are you doing? What, what's going on? The Navy thinks that one of us is a Soviet spy. You've got more secrets than the best of them. What if I don't fancy her in that way? Can't tell anyone, Ellen. It's illegal. I'm just a mathematician. Sometimes it is the people who no one imagines anything of who do the things that no one can imagine. Maria, Tatiana. You think I'd know the first question already? It's just a privilege to be, uh, I just gotta have a moment. It's a, such a privilege to be with you guys because each one of these is the best it can be for the material and the characters that you're doing and it's just, it's just a privilege, thank you. Thank you. So, again, how you got your training and how did you get started? Um, I wanted to be an, a designer when I was about eight years old. My father was an art director and I absolutely was fascinated by that whole world. I went to university, I read fine art at Oxford. I did student productions the whole time. I was in the Oxford Playhouse Edinburgh Festival every year. And then I did a postgrad course in theater design. And then I needed to earn some money and I went to the BBC. And I stayed there for a short three years before I sprung off into the freelance world. So that's basically my history. I, um, I did textile design at Glasgow School of Art and then um, came to London, didn't know what to do, was trying to work out what I should be doing and somebody suggested I try art, art department stuff so I volunteered at the National Film School. Did, did, got, I was told to apply, applied, got in, did, 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 a, did a postgraduate in film design and then just started working as a junior and I've worked my way up. This movie um, spans 30 years of the 20th century, um, from the boarding school in the 1920s to the World War II centerpiece of the film. We've got Hut 8, Joan's parents, um, her boarding house, the Bletchley Manor house, all of the intelligence environments, London during the Blitz, fast forward 10 years to the police station, Turing's apartment in 1951, it seems it was so rich in the detailing and all of the, um, um, just the emotion of each set. Um, but how did you go about balancing and contrasting the decorative themes for the three decades? And was there, in your minds, was there a lot of difference between the decades? Or did they, how did you do it? How did I you make it I just think that's completely instinctive. Isn't that in all our DNA, all of us as designers? Just I would by think. all the work that you've done. Yeah, it's, it's. Yes, 
I mean, we, we do a huge amount of visual research, and I literally wallpaper the walls from floor, floor to ceiling. But then I, you know, I, I want to be fully informed, but I don't feel I have to adhere to everything. So it comes from, uh, I think for me, it's impo for both of us, it's important to have the knowledge and then use the bits. It's an editing process. The whole thing's an editing process. But, you know, the three periods, I, I, that is something that is just actually very fundamental Second to what nature. we do. Yeah, yeah. And what about the, I mean, you have to be somewhat specific about those time periods, right? This, the early childhood and then moving on. Yeah, yeah, you do, you, yeah. But I don't think you, I think you just, you know your period and you, when you're looking for stuff, you, you look for something that works for that period and, and got to bear in mind what's come before because I think it's dangerous if you're too on the nose with mm, the period. Absolutely. So, you, you know, you, you, as long as you stop at the right date, you know, you, anything, anything goes. So, so what I'm gathering is this expertise of knowing the periods and then, again, Someone said it a few minutes ago, letting it go. Yeah. To just let it start. To but it's also it. that thing of, you know, it's set in the, the school scenes in the 20s. You're, you're, you know, you're having decorative elements from decades before and mixing it and not, as Tat said, being too on the nose with it. Yeah, but, you know, it, it's interesting because uh, at the, in some of my research, uh, in the process of making this, you were at that wonderful moment in time of information that was so secretive for so long all of a sudden is in the museum and there's exhibits and you, all of a sudden you have access to all these sort of pieces of the puzzle. Well, actually, the, the research was quite straightforward because Bletchley Park exists as a museum. Right. And they actually have a lot of visual archives that they recreated after the war. So the photographs that they have, and uh, it, they were, everything was destroyed. It was there. So, well, it oh, was no, it was destroyed. It right. was destroyed. So at Bletchley, they recreated the scenario. So they uh -huh. took photographs which they staged in all those huts. So it's the real hut with the real furniture, but it's random bits of paper yeah. rather than real bits of code because they yeah. destroyed everything. Right. But then they've recreated it all. And they've got, a, they've got a facsimile of the bomb machine in the museum as well, which we sort of based ours on, but extrapolated. Yeah, but, and that's, that's my point is you knew what the real thing was, but yeah. then you took it that step further to give it an emotional context so it serviced the story that you wanted to tell. Yes, and tried to make it look cinematically interesting as well, mm. I hope. And, and that was by? By? Um, the very first day on the scout, Morton Tildum and I went up to Bletchley and we looked at this thing and it, it sits in a big box and we were kind of slightly <laughs> scratching our heads going, this isn't so interesting. It's this big cube with some rotors that go round. <laughs> and then we wandered around the back and you saw the innards and the inner workings and suddenly that became much more interesting. So on that very first day, we decided not to sit it in its box and to open it out like a book. So you see much more of the inner workings. And right. you know, the machine does have red wires spilling out of it and we exaggerated the quantity of those wires. Mm -hmm. um, and... <laughs> Why not? Yeah, and ours is slightly bigger. It's about two foot higher and mm -hmm. three foot wider. We, right. but, but hopefully, hopefully. I mean, it's actually our, our facsimile is now sitting at Bletchley Park. So it's now in their exhibit. It's the so, riddle. Which is the real one? <laughs> so hopefully <laughs> the people who know didn't think ours looked too ridiculous. <laughs> oh, well, you can't please all engineers. <laughs> Tatiana, can you give us uh, some examples of uh, your sourcing process for the scientific and technical objects. That seems like it was an awfully large job. Um, May, yes, we, we, we just, we, 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 you have to start by putting ads in, in, old, in old boys magazines and you know, collectors <laughs> and who have things in their sheds and, 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 just, and through a network of, of these people, you, you, you pull things in and it's, it's a long process. Um, but, thirty um, old guys with thirty yeah, old radios yeah. turning up. Yeah. So did, did were you en did you end up having to? I mean, obviously, besides the big machine, did you end up using mostly real objects that you just reconditioned? Absolutely, we didn't even recondition them. I think oh, they were they were in, they were in, they just they are what they are, and they they came out of the and sheds they were treasured and by people. Somebody came along and made all the lights work, you know, so that they but they were really treasured and really enthusiastic, fantastic, fantastic people who who all came out of the woodwork and. And did you know? Did, did we're happy did to help us. Very happy to help us. And where does and did you give it back to them? Of course, it's their course. stuff. Rent goes, it. Oh. goes home with them. <laughs> <laughs> We've got thirty radios <laughs> in, in her shed. Well, as always, you, know, you have superior uh, con color control and, and textures, and the, 
you know, it's hard not to notice in the wall coverings that it's it's got a sort of a decimal kind of digital effect as opposed to seeing flowers and exactly you yeah. know it's just it's it's all woven throughout what you're doing um was there an aha moment for you in when early on that you finally figured out yeah, what you there, were doing there really was, was there really was tat tat and i and the supervising art director went to a museum uh, exhibition at the science museum in london where they happened to be at the perfect time uh, an exhibition about Turing at, and Bletchley, and there was one of Turing's little drawings, and it was some, it was something that none of us actually even understood what it was—a little annotated diagram, which, which was sort of geometric shapes and notes on squared notebook paper, and it was red and black, and these little it, it, and there was something about the geometric quality and that use of red that became quite salient, and and you know for me the research process is a very important thing, and and and, and when you put all the references up on the wall, a color palette comes out at you from, from the references rather than something that we've imposed onto it, if it's that always, makes sense. It's always amazing that the, the way that you can, um, you have all the references up and you look at them and you go, okay, so this is our film. And then you, you, but at the end of the film, you look back at them and go, oh my God, it really is, you know? So that the film is there from day one, it's mm -hmm. on the walls. And it's a bit like looking at a child and going, oh, what will you look like? And then looking at them when they're grown up going, well, of course you're gonna look like that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's true, it's true. Uh, and we're talking about graphics. You must have worked with, either you drew it or you drew it or you had a graphic designer had a, we all had, of those we little had, drawings. We had, we had, we had, had very, good, very good graphics team, yeah. That's fantastic. So. Was someone assigned to be the signature of Turing, though, in terms of all those little graphics? Was yes. that mm. You said, that's you, you are him. Yeah. Oh, well, there was, there was somebody we had... A, a, <laughs> no, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Who, who did all the graphics throughout the film, yeah. including yeah. The, the, uh, all his diagrams. Because yes. it is a voice. Mm. Mm. So. And we, obviously we had his, we had the originals. And you had the originals so referred to, yeah. So we knew what to do there, you know. Yeah. Um, and his, his final home, uh, yes. Is that, uh, is that based on fact, or was that just really out of your imagination? Everything that you see on those walls would, well, one thing that actually I found incredibly satisfying is that from our research, everything that you see on those walls in that mess mm -hmm. is stuff that made sense um, with the stuff he was studying at that period mm -hmm. in his life. And Andrew Hodges, who is who wrote Turing's biography, mm. and it's a very academic piece. It's actually quite a hard read, I have I to say. I picked it up, and I'm <laughs> okay, still so on you the know. forward. <laughs> All right, so you know what I mean. But he visited us in the art department, and he was incredibly enthusiastic about all the references. And that it, it sort of I was very pleased because it validated my choices, which I have to admit are always driven by an aesthetic. Right. Um, you know, drive, and, and then to have it validated by somebody from his very academic approach was very gratifying. And Turing was interested in a vast amount. I mean, from, he was, it was biology, morphogenesis, and mm -hmm. um, we had to, I had to get a friend of mine who's a chemistry teacher to put together a chemistry experiment that, that, um, that was described in our research that he had been doing the day before. He had set up just, before, you know, at some point. He'd been doing it with a friend. So she had to assemble it with, I took her to a prop house and she assembled it with all the, with all the old stuff. And then I packed it away in a box and brought it out. On with the, photographs. On the with the photographs to, to, so we could put the thing back together, not understanding a word of what, you know, what was going on at all. And, um, and so there was, there was chemistry, biology, you know, physics, maths, you know, everything there. And, that and we know nothing about. That we know nothing about, but you know, it, it was, it was astrology. Astrology, I mean, everything. He was into everything. Was Benedict Cumber Cumberbatch very involved in, in the sets, and did he come along? He wasn't involved, but he was. He was. He's very receptive yeah. and really and really enthusiastic. I mean, there's one thing where, where which where is that that um, Alan Turing had his cup chained to the radiator behind him in her tape, so no one else would use his cup. So you know, details like that, even if they don't feature in the film, that the actors really like. Yeah, he did an incredible job yeah. inhabiting yeah. that part. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, again, the wonderful thing, just like with Mr. Turner, you took what could have been a biopic kind of thing and you gave it an emotional contents, context and took it into a place of its own imagination. It's just a very rich experience to watch. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Stay put now.